Welcome to Ethics Today, a program dedicated to listening to people who can give us an informed perspective on things that are going on in the world, world so that we might act in a more ethical and responsible manner. Today's guest is Bruce Feiler. Bruce is the author of six consecutive New York Times bestsellers, including Council of Dads, which inspired a new drama series on NBC. His latest book, Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age, describes his journey across America, collecting hundreds of life stories, exploring how we can navigate life's growing number of transitions to live with more meaning, purpose, and joy. So Bruce, thank you so much for taking some time to be with me today. Um, it's my pleasure, Rick. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for all you're doing to help all of us uh, navigate these waters with uh, a, a, sense of, a sense of ethics and a sense of um, shared humanity. It's, it's really a, a value you're providing for, for, for many people. Well, I've, I've really been enjoying your latest book. And uh, it's especially at this time where we're all somewhat introspective and I think retrospective as well. Mm -hmm. And you, you start out early in your book talking about going to your 30th college reunion and how uh, people were sharing their, their successes and you asked them to instead tell them what, tell you what they had been struggling with, what was keeping them awake at night. And you talk about how difficult that is for many of us to do. Why, why do we have such a hard time telling our life stories in that way? Well, I know that you and I, in the lead up to this conversation, have discovered that we have a shared interest in narratives and the stories that we tell ourselves. And in, in some ways, this conversation is going to be about that. And I think that you know, we're all shaped by the earliest stories that we hear and that we tell, right? These are our superhero stories, right? Or, or these are stories that all have happy endings or, or these are fairy tales. And I think that that kind of a paradigm of a story is caught in our heads. And, and you know, in a lot of ways, that is the, the story uh, that I could have told about my adult life, right? I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, as you know, I left there. Um, I went to Yale, went to Japan, started writing stories, started writing letters home. And everywhere I went, people said, when I came back to home, to Georgia, people said, I loved your letters. And I was like, that's great. Have we met? And it turned out that my grandmother had Xeroxed those letters and passed them around and they went viral in the old fashioned sense of the word. And then I just, so I discovered very early on that this idea of telling stories was how I made sense of the world. And, and in my 20s, I lived in Japan. I uh, you know, lived in England, got a master's degree, spent a year as a circus clown. Uh, in my 30s, I went back and forth to the Middle East and dug into the oldest stories and in some ways the greatest stories that have ever been told, retracing biblical stories through the deserts and mountains and war zones of the Middle East. And this is my life and would have been my life. I got married. You're actually talking to me um, on my 17th wedding anniversary. And um, I had children. But in my 40s, I had a back-to-back -back set of disruptive life experiences. And, and these were challenging moments personally, but also they're kind of narrative moments in their own way. Like, oh, wait a minute. So first, I was a 43-year-old man, and I was diagnosed with a life-threatening cancer. I had three-year-old daughters at the time, and that's when I created a council of dads for my girls that inspired the NBC show. But what I found was it messes everybody up. Like, you know, like, wait a minute, it's supposed to be the parents who get sick, not the children for my parents, right? Then I was a parent, right? And we try to protect our children and suddenly I couldn't protect myself. And it was really like, well, how do I tell this story? That was the year of the recession. And um, I suffered greatly in that. My family owned a lot of real estate in Georgia and that all got wiped out. And then, as you know, and I tell the story in the opening of Life is in the Transitions, my father had Parkinson's and that's a disease of the dopamine, which affects your movement, but now we know your mood too. And he got depressed and tried to kill himself six times in 12 weeks. So I had this kind of back-to-back -back experience. It was like, okay, wait a minute, my life isn't a fairy tale anymore. And like, what happens? How am I gonna get back to the happy ending? And I got very interested in this. And part of what fed that was that I started sending my dad a question every Monday morning when he was suffering, thinking we're gonna lose the stories back to the story part of this whole thing. And he would answer, he couldn't even move his fingers at the time. He would answer the question for a page or two, like tell me about the house you grew up, the toys you played with, how'd you become an Eagle Scout, how'd you join the Navy, how'd you meet mom? And he backed in, we did this for five years and he backed into writing this autobiography and it was the most powerful transformation I'd ever seen. 
So that then takes me to my college reunion. And what happened was I was suffering a bit. I had thrown out my back. I'd had this experience with my dad and I was invited to moderate a panel of prominent classmates. So we get there, it's a Friday afternoon. There's 250 people in the audience and I had driven with a friend who was, I thought we'd catch up. We're driving up to New Haven. I live in Brooklyn, as you know, and he's on top of the world. He's closing a $400 million real estate deal. And he's crushed because one of his partners had a nine month old and the nine month old had gone down for a nap the prior day and never woken up. And so this story's in my head, my own story's in my head. So I'm, I'm, I got all the, you know, when you're monitoring a panel, you've done it. Everyone sent you their resume. It's very neatly typed. It looks very linear. It looks very successful. And I looked at these people and I just couldn't do it. And I ripped them in half. And I said, you know what? I don't want to hear your successes. Tell your mother, right? Losers don't come to a college reunion. I want to hear your struggles. I want to know what keeps you awake at night. And that night, reunion scene, bar, you know, big tent, bar on one end, bar BQ on the other end. And it takes me two hours to walk from side to side because everybody came up and just poured out a story to me. My wife had a headache and went into the hospital and died the next day. My daughter tried to kill herself. My boss is a crook. I'm being sued for malpractice. I've just been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And what everybody was saying was that the life I'm living is not the life I'm, I expected. Like I'm somehow living life out of order. And so I called my wife, as you say, and I said, look, uh, Linda's my wife. And I said, no one knows how to tell their story anymore. And I've got to figure out why, and I've got to do something to help. And that's what launches, into, you know, launches me into this uh, project of collecting life stories of people all across the country. Well, this, you talk about your, you, this changed your dad's life, his attitude, right, toward, towards the end of his life. Um, and, and years ago, you wrote this column in New York Times that went viral, the stories that bind us. And yes. you talked in there about the importance for, of children learning their place in a family story. But you seem to s suggest in this new book that this isn't just for children, this is for people at any age, right? So I think that that's right. So just a quick backstory on the stories that bind us. I was writing about families and I wrote this New York Times column for a decade and I was introduced to two psychologists at Emory, Robin Fivish and Marshall Duke. And they had done research that found that children um, who know more about their family history are better able to navigate the bumps in life that they find. And what, when I dug deeper, what Marshall explained to me is that there, that narratives have a kind of shape. And he was like, there's ascending narratives, family narratives, right? Um, we came from nothing, we worked hard, we have a lot. There's descending narratives, like, you know, we had a lot, there was a war, a recession, a pandemic, and then we lost it all. Or there's an oscillating family narrative, right? That grandpa came here, he worked hard, his house burned down. His daughter was the first fam in the family to go to college, then she got breast cancer. And the children who understand that life is an oscillating narrative are better able to navigate the bumps in, in the road when they hit them. And it's, it's not like it's passed down through the blood. Marshall, in fact, has <laughs> adopted children. It's that it's an expectation of what we're going to find in our lives. And so it, that was in my mind when I created this Life Story Project. So what the Life Story Project was, was I crisscrossed the country, gathering hundreds of life stories of Americans, all ages, all walks of life, all 50 states, people who lost limbs, lost homes, changed careers, changed genders, got out of cults, got out of hate groups. And then with a team of 12 people, I spent a year coding these stories for 57 different variables, high point, low point, what transitions they handled well, what advice from friends was most valuable, you know, what creative activities they pursued, what did they shed, what emotions did they struggle with, et cetera. And, and, and what I discovered is that this linear life that I had been led to believe, and frankly, that I now understand, we've been told for the first century of psychology is what life will look like. You know, we've been told Freud, there are states, you know, psychosexual stages of development. Piaget with adolescent development. Erickson, this, the eight stages of development. The five stages of grief, the hero's journey. These are all linear construct. And this reaches its peak in the 70s with this idea of the midlife crisis, which you know, came out of UCLA and in New Haven um, at Yale and was popularized by Gail Sheehy in Passages. And this says literally that everything in life is predictable. The subtitle of Passages, which sold 20 million copies, is the predictable you know, crises of adult life. 
And she says, everyone does the same thing in their 20s, the same thing in 30s. Everyone has a midlife crisis that must start at 39 and must end by 44. You know, that resonated with people clearly. Divorce was popular at the time, women were entering the workplace, et cetera, but it's bunk. Like our lives do not follow that rigid structure. And so it turns out that one of the big things that I was kind of stumbling into and then ended up digging and rooting around and understanding is the idea that every culture says, our lives have a paradigmatic shape, right? So that in the ancient world, they thought life was a cycle. In the middle ages, a staircase up to middle age and then down. And then the linear life, now that's all gone. And we've changed how we understand the world. We understand that the world is complex and chaos theory and all the cutting edge things that, that, that your community is studying and teaching and learning every day. Um, but we haven't adjusted our expectations for our lives, that our lives have nonlinear shapes. And that became a big passion of mine to try to understand what people were expecting, what they were living, and how they reconciled what happens when the expectation was not the reality. Is there, so, I mean, we do have this recognition of increasing complexity in this nonlinear shape, I think, so forth. Is, are, but are, are we, does that help us to get better at telling our stories or are there things I'm wondering if social media is helping us tell our stories or making it harder for us in some ways. Well, those are, those are interesting and different questions. Let me, let me yeah. first deal with the first one. Yeah, I think that the nonlinearity that we see in the world is, um, is helpful, but we haven't yet, we understand that life is nonlinear. We understand that somebody can get discovered on a, at, a, at a coffee shop in Hollywood. We understand that Lynn, Lynn manuel Miranda can be going on vacation and just grab a copy of the Hamilton biography at the airport and suddenly create a defining piece of art. So we know that randomness happens. We know that everybody l listening to this conversation who made a New Year's resolution in 2020 um, that New Year's resolution was, was you know, <laughs> uh, upended by the pandemic. We know anybody in a job interview who said where they want to be in five years from now, five years ago, was wrong because of this pandemic, right? So, but I think that we have forgotten, you know, it's interesting, one of the things that I did in my, as you know, my book built up this whole idea of how we live our lives. There's disruptors and there's life quakes, and I know we're going to get to that in a minute, but you know, one of the interesting wrinkles of this, of these conversations that I had is that I asked people the biggest life quake, the biggest disruptive event in their lives. And then I categorized them in a very small number, 8% were, were collective um, uh, involuntary life quakes, which is what we're in now because of the pandemic. Had we done this a century ago, two world wars, you know, depression, Korea, Vietnam, women's rights, civil rights, I think people knew that they were being buffeted by world events in a way that they couldn't control. I think we're coming off of about a 20 year period, certainly in most of the lives of your students, and frankly, in most of the adult lives of the teachers and, and people in, in the community listening to this, we have forgotten <laughs> that, that, that difficult things happen. It's been 20 years since 9-11, right? It's even been more than a decade since the recession. And so I think that we have a little bit forgotten that we can be buffeted and we forget that we don't control our life stories. The social media aspect of it, I think there is a, like so many aspects of social media, a double-edged sword. On the one hand, what social media does is gives everybody the ability to tell their story all the time, okay? So that we used to live, when I was young, um, and I grew up in the 70s in Georgia, a, a small number of people had a microphone. A small number of people told their stories and a large number of us listened. Okay, what we now live in a you know in a multi microphone world where everybody has a microphone and you know coming out of say Black Lives Matter and the protest movements we've seen uh, even in the middle of 2020 part of that is we need to listen be, we need to listen to, to more stories and we need to elevate and amplify more voices and I think that one of the things that social media does is give people that opportunity to be heard when they don't have access to the most elite newspapers and magazines and television and publishers and all of the people who used to control the narratives. The problem is, is it's a pressure to tell our story all the time. And there's something about social media that forces us to make a decision. Do we want to have a happy, perfect life? Do we want to have an everything is awful and difficult life? And the, the pressure on us when we're in the middle of living through difficult times to be reporting on those publicly it is 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 an aching challenge for a lot of people. Yeah, 
Yeah, and you, and I, so this is a good point to transition this idea of life quakes, which you mentioned, because this, um, we, I, I think with this pressure to always tell the story and in some ways always then tell a positive story, um, you, you say we, we tend to repress these major transitions or these life, these huge disruptions in our life. And, and one of the goals you say of your book is to get us to change our attitude towards these transitions. So let's, let's, let me just take a half a step back. So what I did was I gathered these hundreds of stories, 225 life stories. Then I create this massive database. And then my goal is to sort of understand how we live now and kind of can I tease out any patterns and takeaways that can help all of us live better. And so what I quickly realized is that, you know, this a sort of a big theme emerges. And the big theme is that the linear life is dead. It's been replaced by what I call in life is in the transitions. Um, by the way, for anybody watching here, you know, here's the actual book that we're talking about. Uh, life is in the transitions, mastering change um, at any age. I quickly realized that, um, so I call this the nonlinear life, and this involves um, um, more life transitions. And so what I discovered was that there are two units that interrupt our, our linear expectations. Um, one is a set of disruptors, okay? So there turns out there's 52 different disruptors we experience. I call them the deck of disruptors. These can be um, involving our families. It couldn't be involved in starting a relationship or ending a relationship, losing a loved one, having a child with special needs, having a baby, becoming an empty nester. They involve our work lives. It could mean uh, starting a new job, losing a job. It could be getting more responsibilities, okay? It involves our beliefs, changing political orientation, um, uh, changing sexual or, or orientations, becoming less religious, becoming more religious, you know, going on extended personal travel. It could involve our identity. It could involve um, our bodies. It could be getting sick, having a diagnosis, you know, a chronic disease, you know, mental illness, depression, et cetera. So we, we each are going to experience, my data show, three dozen such disruptors in the course of our lives. That's one every 12 to 18 months. For the record, that's like more often than many people go to the dentist. So, but most of these we get through relatively easily. Okay, we're pretty good at it. Okay, we adjust. We, you know, we we turn to our support networks. We, you know, re, you know tweak or revise our um, our narratives, and we move on. But one in ten of them—that's three to five times in the course of our lives—we they become a massive uh, life. A disruption. And I call this, as you say, a life quake because it's kind of higher on the Richter scale of consequences and there can be aftershocks for many years. And what's, as I said earlier, um, these life quakes, they can be voluntary or involuntary, right? It, it voluntary, they, you know, involuntary might be that our spouse cheats on us, right? Or we have an accident or we get a diagnosis or we have a child with special needs. Voluntary might be we cheat on our spouse, right? Or we want to change religions or we want to, uh, you know, move, okay? 61% of people move in, in life transitions, which I don't know about you, but 61% of the conversations I have now are, ta are talking to people who want to move in the wake of the pandemic. So they can be voluntary, involuntary, but they lead to a life transition. And that must be voluntary. You must choose to make the change. And if you think about the pandemic, I think a lot of us experienced, and many, many people still might be experiencing, depending on when you're listening to this, we were frozen. We were scared, we were afraid, we were stuck, we didn't know what was gonna happen. That's the life quake. The life transition is what kind of what, what you can begin to hear now, which is, am I in the job that I wanna be in? Am I in the relationship I want, am I in? Do I wanna be doing work that has more meaning? Do I wanna spend you know, more time at my religious institution or less time at my religious institution? Do I wanna move? It, do I wanna have another child? I recently read that three uh, third of women are saying they are delaying having children because of the pandemic, could be financial reasons, whatever. So my point is that's the life transition. You have to choose to go into that. And I think in a lot of ways, the most exciting thing that I then dug into was um, a toolkit for navigating these times. I tried to identify what is it that people do? What skills do they deploy when they're in a life quake? And can I identify takeaways that can make people get through these periods uh, more productively and more efficiently and with more meaning? And that's, I, I noticed one of the tools you mentioned was rituals that mm. 
allow us. And I found that just fascinating because we're a society that uh, like doesn't really recognize rituals anymore. Why? Why did this happen? We so associated rituals with organized religion that when we began to question organized religion, and by the way, organized religion, as we've seen with, like, say, the say just to pick one example, the Catholic sex abuse scandal, it did nothing to, uh, um, did nothing if not encourage people to question the authority of organized religion. We, we associate, I mean, religion survived for, for millennia because it did a lot of very effective things. Um, and one of them was ritual, yeah. So isn't that, isn't that fascinating that people do it, even people who would deny any interest in religion, told me stories of getting tattoos or jumping out of planes or going to sweat lodges or doing these things. So again, to take a half a step back, so when we go into these transitions, it, they seem like bottomless, endless, structureless bogs, right? That we're just gonna get stuck down. But I sat, I mean, I'm talking to you from my office here. I sat in this office and in lots of offices and, and homes like yours, for day after day, hour after hour, talking to people about life, life transitions, it turns out that certain patterns appear. And I think that the big, that they have a kind of structure that I never thought about before and that most people don't think about. It turns out to be reassuring <laughs> when you listen to it. So what Life is in the Transitions does is map out this kind of model, the first new model for life transitions in 50 years. And step one is that they have phases, right? And the three phases are what I call the long goodbye, where you kind of say goodbye to the old you, the messy middle where you're shedding certain habits and creating new ones, and then this new beginning where you begin to unveil your new self. And so in the, in the and by the way, you don't have to do them in order. We were told for a century that you have to do them in order. They don't. Transitions are nonlinear, just like lives are nonlinear. But one of the things is that people struggle with emotions. And I think one of the most illuminating things that I did was I asked people, almost by accident, tell me the biggest emotion that you struggled with and the answers were electrifying and they fell into a very clear pattern. So the number one was fear. Mm -hmm. People are scared of the unknown. What's coming? Am I gonna lose money? Am I gonna lose status? How am I gonna get through? Am I gonna survive? So the number one was fear. The number two was sadness, grief. Like, oh, I liked <laughs> the role I used to have. I liked being married to that person or being a parent or having that stability or that income or whatever. And, and uh, they're just sad. You have to mourn the past that's not coming past, that's not coming back, and that's going to be past. And then the third, which shocked me, was shame. Like, I'm ashamed of what I did, or I'm ashamed to have lost the status, or I'm ashamed to have lost my job, or I'm ashamed of X, Y, or Z, um, of having a child um, who, who, who is addicted, say, and is not the perfect child that I wanted. So people are grappling with these emotions. And the, so that raises the question, what do you do to get past that emotion? And here's where rituals be become very powerful. We need ceremonies, we need to sing, dance, sweat, <laughs> purge, turpentine, whatever it might be, you need something to kind of blanch the emotion and also help you signify to yourself and to others around you that the past is past. And that is what religion uh, served well. People religious may be naturally drawn to it, but it turns out even people who aren't religious understand that rituals uh, mementos, mourning, these things that that ceremonialize a goodbye. It could be a big thing like a farewell party. It could be a personal thing, as I said, like a tattoo. It could be going to a sweat lodge. It could be gathering everybody together. I mean, I talked to, I talked to a guy who's a Benjamin Franklin impersonator in Philadelphia who had a kind of long, somewhat tortured job at the post office for decades. And he quit to become a full-time Benjamin Franklin impersonator. And at the end, he literally gathered all his colleagues, took his guitar and literally sang, take this job and shove it to everybody because he had a kind of somebody who outplayed him in a political circumstance. So these rituals are very important um, mechanisms for controlling time and acknowledging the past is past and now I got to move forward to whatever comes next, even if I'm afraid of it. I, I love the way you put that because it's, we really, these, the transition, to make the transition effective, we have to move it out of our heads where we can keep recycling it. Yes, out eliminating. Out the world right, into a public action where it takes place in time. Now, here's something interesting, which is that rituals turn out to be 
not only important in the long goodbye part of it, rituals turn out to be interesting in the new beginning part of it. So at the end of your transition, as you know, as you know one of this kind of signature findings and shocking and fascinating ones to me was that the average length of these transitions was five years. That was the most common number and the average number. And if you think, um, and this gets back to your question, well, you know, I can get to that in a second about reimagining these periods. If you think that they, we go through three to five in a lifetime, they take four or five or six years. That's 25 years. That's half our adult lives and transitions, which is why I want to reimagine them. But to quickly make the point before I get to that about rituals at the end of the ritual. We've gone through the slog, right? We've confronted our emotion. We've ritualized saying goodbye. We've shed some habits. We've been incredibly creative. We've turned to our friends. Now you've rewritten your story. Now you want to unveil your new self. That is also incredibly important. That also could be a party or a tattoo. Or I talked to a woman who was a high-powered New York ad executive for, the, for, for, uh, for AOL, actually. And she had three migraines a day since she was three. And she logged onto a conference call, heard her friends talking about how her colleagues, how sour she was. She walked home, combed through her, um, uh, combed through her Amex bills, realized she could live for 18 months in her savings, quit the next day. Three days later, saw someone talking about being a life coach, be transformed her life, cured her migraines and became the country's leading hypnotist. She literally works with veterans for the VA. And so here she's got this powerful status job and she's now a hypnotist. And she tells me she spent six months rewriting and being afraid to update her LinkedIn profile because she's worried about what her friends are gonna think that she's like gone cuckoo, right? So finally, after six months of writing, she presses send, that's her ritual. She's now unveiled her new self and she's finally ready, ready to admit again to others but frankly to herself, that this is the new her. And so rituals are important at the beginning and at the end. That's, that's so fascinating. And I, we, well, we could spend all day just talking about that part of it. I mean, this is what is so great about your book. It just, it just rich, not only in like what you describe, the stories you tell and so forth, but it's also so suggestive. I mean, I had to keep stopping to, to, to think more about like the implications of, of, what was just starting there. But I, I wanna ask you a final question and that's, it's caused me to think about what I should be doing differently as a university professor because universities were, were really good at, at teaching skills, uh, especially preparation for, for students who are moving into the professions and then other skills like me as a philosopher, I'm teaching critical thinking skills and so forth. But it, it occurs to me that we're really not doing a very good job of preparing our students for these transitions. And so I'm, I'm just wondering what advice you would give to me and my colleagues about how we might approach education differently. Well, first of all, I appreciate that question and the opportunity to, to have such a thoughtful conversation uh, with you and the community. And I'm looking forward to the events we're gonna be doing together uh, in the months ahead. And this question I would say allows me to answer the, the, the one outstanding question you said earlier, uh, which is rebranding transitions and then pivot to what that means for, um, uh, I think, the incredible opportunity that those in a university setting have. So the point that I want to make about transitions being valuable is if you take the kind of big, big idea here that our lives are nonlinear, they involve many more transitions. If you add up, do the math on what I said, three to five in a lifetime, they take four or five or six years, that's half of our adult lives. We have spent certainly my entire life, and frankly, most of the last century, talking about life transitions as miserable periods that we have to slog and grit and grind and now meditate and mindfulness our way through. And while those techniques can help, that is a, we're saying that half of our lives are awful periods. In fact, if you look at the great stories of Western civilization and frankly, Eastern civilization too. The great religions all have periods, Hinduism, the forest dwelling, the Abrahamic face with the, um, uh, with the desert dwelling, okay? You have all the great myths involve people from Oedipus to Jason to Hercules are going off you know, into, the, into the wilderness, into periods of strain, and, and the, the great novels do too. These are periods of incredible growth and opportunity, and we need to rebrand re them as periods, not that we have to grit and grind our way through, but as opportunities for growth, rebirth, and renewal. Because 
a problem with the word resilience, uh, which has become so kind of trendy of late, is that it implies that you're going back. Resilience is actually a, a word that comes out of out of physics and and springs. The, the spring stretches and then the spring goes back. Um, and uh, you know, the, the coiled spring I'm referring to here. That some of us may go back, but we also may go someplace different. You know, left, right, forward, or someplace entirely. And that is a way to think about it, which is why my book is called "Life Is in the Transitions." It's a William James phrase. Of course, of course, James understood it at the birth of psychology a century ago. Life is in the transitions, he said, more than in the terms connected, more than in the stable parts. So turning now, taking that philosophy that this is a life skill that we can and we must master. Some of us are born into transition and to, into a life quake. We may have alcoholic parents or parents who get divorced. Some of us lose a parent when we're young. Of course, as you know, I almost die when my children are young, as we talked about with cancer and counsel of dads. Some of us go through addiction or, or depression when we're teens and social media, as we know, um, uh, seems in some ways to, to escalate that. But for most students entering a university, this is the first collective life quake that they are going to experience. Like that is part of the experience. You are separating yourselves from your parents. You're going into the wilderness. You're doing it in a way that is safe and, and um, scaffolded with other people. But to me, that's how we should talk about college. We should talk about college as a collective voluntary life quake and uh, help our students understand that, that it's going to be a struggle. They're going to shed parts of their identity. They're going to experiment with new parts of their identity. They need to ritualize the past and, and identify their emotions. They need to see it as a narrative event because it fundamentally is a narrative event of who do I want to be? What do I want to do? What gives me meaning? Some people might get meaning by working hard and making money. Some people might, might do it by giving back. Some people might be doing it by traveling and the pandemic is going to make that even more urgent because the old traditional uh, uh, roles we're going to fall into are, are going to be challenged themselves as business and society are changing around us. So to me, the opportunity that colleges have is to see themselves as fundamentally the first collective breach that everybody is going through together. There is no story. You cannot tell a story back to where this conversation began without there being a breach. We think it's going to be a fairy tale because it starts with somebody with a dream and it has a happy ending. That turns out to be wrong. It's the wolf that makes it a fairy tale. Something is gonna turn up. It's a wolf, an ogre, a dragon, a monster. It could be a, a tornado. It could be an earthquake, a diagnosis, a pandemic. That, that is the moment, that is the life quake. And our temptation is to shield our eyes. Don't shield your eyes when the wolf appears because that's when the hero is made. And the primary role that we all have in our lives is to make ourselves the hero of our own narrative. And that's what college is. It's an opportunity to tell students that we're in the business of breach repair. We're in the business of things are gonna go wrong in your life. We're gonna give you the tools, <laughs> the character, the community uh, and the skills in order to breach those, uh, uh, breach those alterations in the normal and go back, write a new chapter of your life and go on and be your own hero. Well, I think, I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And this is a, this is a great conversation and um, really looking forward to uh, talking with you more in the coming months. Thank you very much. Uh, um, good luck as everybody returns to school and uh, life is in the transitions. Let's, let's embrace them. That's great. Thanks.